A study by the Brookings Institute finds that the 2020 election only exacerbated the economic divide between Republican and Democratic voters. And nothing makes that clear based on how people voted based on where they live. And I'm not talking about red states versus blue states. I'm talking about big cities versus rural areas of the country. So according to their study, the stark economic rift that Brookings Metro documented after Donald Trump's shocking 2016 victory has grown even wider. In 2016, we wrote that the 2,584 counties that Trump won generated just 36% of the country's economic output. Whereas the 472 counties Hillary Clinton carried equated to almost two thirds of the nation's aggregate economy. Now that rift, that divide is much more pronounced in 2020. This time Biden's winning base in the 477 counties encompasses fully 70%, 70% of America's economic activity. While Trump's losing base of 2,497 counties represents just 29% of the economy. Biden's counties tended to be far more diverse, educated and white collar professional with their aggregate non-white and college educated shares of the economy running to 35 and 36% respectively compared to 16 and 25% in counties that voted for Trump. So John, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. I mean, my first thought isn't necessarily what this is directly about, but it is amazing that after almost four years and everything that we've been through, Biden won five additional counties. And I know, you know, it was enough, obviously, to flip the results significantly. And his popular vote lead is going to be significantly larger than Hillary Clinton's. He's going to have the highest percentage of the vote share of someone challenging an incumbent president for almost 100 years. But you would have expected perhaps more. Yeah, I mean, the the question is, I mean, for those counties, why why didn't things change more? In theory, you got the president that you wanted. You got the Senate that you wanted, you had the House for a couple of those years, you have the Supreme Court. What did Donald Trump do? Did did his strategies economically benefit you in that time? And I'm sure many of them think that they do, whether they did or not. But his, his trade deals, you know, was that actually a benefit? And especially if you were to deduct the, free, the like the sort of socialism that he threw at those at some of these industries to make up for his disastrous trade policies, you know his doubling down on coal and trying to get manufacturing going and all that stuff, did that actually in the end help? Yeah, I, I think that you're asking the right questions, and I think we know what the answers to the, those questions are because we've been covering these stories regarding the economic situation for the vast majority of Americans for the last four years, and it has not improved. Um, but It is really interesting because again, let's just acknowledge that Trump has done nothing for people who are struggling economically in these rural areas. Um, But he talks a lot about how he's working for them. He he always pretends like he's looking out for their best interests, that he's holding China accountable for taking all these great American jobs, that he's gonna fight back and make sure that we have trade deals that are um, much more fair to the, the great people of the United States. You know. His like lofty rhetoric, I think, um, somehow resonates with people in rural areas, even as their material conditions are not improving. And I think another example of that was a recent survey that was done um, that that asked people, "Are you better off today financially than you were four years ago?" And I'm not talking about a survey done by like. Amazon and other, you know, billionaires and things like that. No, just average Americans. Has your financial situation improved? And the majority of Americans said yes. So I think that that kind of reaction perspective um, does help Trump in these rural areas. He constantly, they feel like he's constantly speaking to them, right? And then at the same time, and again, Trump did this. With his own cabinet, where he like filled it with the biggest swamp monsters. Um, but if you look at what Biden's doing with his transition team, you see all sorts of names in there where you're like, bro, what are you doing? Come on, like get it together. So there are some great like union leaders included in his transition team. I don't want to take away from that. Um, but at the same time, uh, he he writes on the website Build Back Better that agency review teams are responsible for understanding the operations of each agency, ensuring a smoother transition of power and preparing for President elect Biden and Vice President elect Harris and their cabinet to hit the ground running from day one. 
And so, okay, that's great. So who are these people who are assisting with this transition? You have Martha Gimbel from Schmidt Futures. Uh, she would serve on the uh, in the group that would help with the transition for Council of Economic Advisors. Ellen Hughes Crom Cromwick from Third Way for Department of <laughs> Commerce. These are not cabinet picks. I want to be clear. These are just individuals who are assisting with the transition. Yep. Um, Lynn Parker Dupre from the Capital One Financial Group. Uh, she would help with the transition for the Department of Homeland Security. James Cardigan from Arnold Ventures LLC. By the way, Arnold Ventures was founded by a hedge fund manager who invested significantly into Enron. But that group will basically help with the transition for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Fantastic. Tom Sullivan from Amazon, Department of State. Matt Olson from Uber Technology. And this is interesting for the intelligence community. And then Cameron Alford from US Bank for International Development. Yeah, I don't, I mean, like, well, you know, for your diplomacy, what do you want? Probably Amazon, you know, they deliver packages, maybe they can deliver a peace deal, you know, intelligence community. Matt Olson, Uber. Well, you know, Uber's probably spying on you, so that makes sense. Look, what I'm assuming here, playing devil's advocate, is that these are people known for management of teams. Compiling mm, information, mm. those sorts of things, I assume, rather than some sort of topical expertise in these things, not knowing their individual histories. I'm assuming it's because they can manage teams that will look into this. But but already the people that he's looking to, it's Wall Street, it's these massive corporations and things like that. There are certainly good managers that don't necessarily work at these sorts of places. Right, and so again, I don't want to pretend as if like Donald Trump was a man of the people. No, he filled his cab his actual cabinet with, you know, an Exxon CEO, with Steve Mnuchin as Treasury Secretary, who, by the way, he actually survived. <laughs> he survived Trump and his lunacy throughout. The first term, I'm actually shocked That's by true. that. But remember, he was the head of One West Bank, which got in trouble for doing all sorts of like fraud in order to foreclose on people's homes. And so, again, Trump was awful. But what are Republicans better at? It's messaging. And so, will Republicans attack Biden if he's hobnobbing with the corporate elite? Of course they will. Did Biden do a good job attacking Trump for? The swamp monsters that served in his cabinet, I don't think so. Um, he should have done a better job in that messaging. And so we'll see how this all plays out, but that's where we're at. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun, but you also get Playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So, all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.